everyone. My name is Pastor Neil. Today, I want to talk about Easter and what it means. I want to talk about Jesus Christ. The title of my keynote speaking today, or sermon as it is, is known as the Nail Scarred Hands. I want to start off with the text found in John chapter 20, verse 24 to 25, and it reads, Now Thomas also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told them, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail mark hands in his hand, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. I have a question for all of you today. And that question is, What is the only man-made thing we will see in heaven. The only man-made thing. Well, it would be the scars on Jesus' hands, the wounds on His feet, the wound at His side. When you go somewhere on vacation, so many times you bring back a souvenir. Jesus visited this planet and He brought back a souvenir. Not something cheap, not something temporary, but something that will endure for all eternity and bought at a fearful price. Today, when I think about the nail-scarred hands, I'm reminded of how the disciples came back proclaiming to the others that they had seen the Lord. But doubting Thomas told everyone that unless he sees the nails mark in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands at his side, I will not believe. A week goes by and Jesus appears before the disciples and tells them, peace be with you. And then he goes to Thomas and all his doubt is taken away. In Isaiah chapter 49 verse 16, it reads, See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. It states that those scars were engraved for us because God loved us so much. There are three things that I want you to remember when it comes to Jesus' nail-scarred hands. The first thing is that beyond a shadow of a doubt, that Jesus suffered. Did you know that crucifixion was the worst or considered the most horrible form of death? Among the Romans, and the degradation was also part of the infliction. And the punishment, if applied to free men, was only used in the case of the vilest criminals. The one to be sacrificed were stripped naked of all his clothes and then followed with the most awful moment of all. He was laid down upon that torturous plank or that long, broad wood. His arms would be stretched out along the cross beams at the center of the open palms the po- in which the huge iron nails was placed in, which by then, by a blow of mallet, was driven home into the wood, then through either foot separately or possibly through both together as they were placed on, o- on over each other. Another huge nail would tore its way through the quivering flesh. See, God Himself also suffered. In Isaiah chapter 42 and 14, it reads, For a long time I have kept silent. I have been quiet and held myself back. But now, like a woman in childbirth, I cry out. I gasp and pant. God also cried out as He was also in distress. In Isaiah 63 verse 9, In all the distress, He too was distressed. And the angels of His presence saved them. In His love and mercy, He redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. So the second thing I want you to remember when it comes to Jesus' nail-scarred hands is that those wounds tell us that God has suffered and that God does suffer. But those wounds also tell us that because He suffered, He knows, He cares, And He understands. Those scars tell us that when we suffer, when we hurt, He hears and understands our pain. His scars are an everlasting image of His humanity. And they tell us that the pain of a man has become the pain of God. 
they speak to the greatness of His love. Whether you understand pain or not, those scars tell us the affliction that He loves you so much. So why? Why is it that God allows pain and suffering? In Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 to 18, to Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it, from, from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. It's because of Adam and Eve that sin entered this world and that God came to the garden and was looking for them. But yet he saw that sin had entered. And by his right, he could have just said to Adam and Eve, okay, no more, this is it. But no, he spared them. He just banished them from the garden. What a painful way to leave that beautiful garden. But yet that was the judgment that God had to do. See, the cruelest thing that God could have done for them is keep them in the garden. You must understand that in the garden there was also the tree of life. And so if sin had entered the world and did enter the world, that means that if Adam and Eve had eaten from the tree of life, sin would be forever. And so God in His grace and mercy banished them. Yes, it was painful. It was a gift of saving grace. Speaking about pain, there is a doctor named Paul Brand, a hand surgeon who had worked for 20 years with lepers. And he states this in his quote, when it comes to pain and how valuable it is. This is what he said. He said, pain is, pain's value is too great. Rather than eliminating pain, I would lend all my energies to doing all I can to help when that pain turns to suffering. When that pain turns to suffering, really, this pain is proof of God's love. You see, pain has a protecting purpose. First of all, Dr. Mann told us that lepers lose the ability to feel that, that they, they lose all kinds of senses as well. Therefore, there are many things that can happen without even them knowing. So yes, pain is necessary. The third and last thing that I want to remind you of when it comes to the nail-scarred hands of Jesus is that not only did He suffer, not only does He understand how we feel, not only can He be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but they also tell us that He has overcome and conquered. It reminds me when I look at those scars or when I read in the Bible about those scars, that after the resurrection, we can see those scars fully. We know that those are real, that they were scars that were once bleeding wounds, and those wounds were healed. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, But He was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on Him. By His wounds, we are healed. I want to encourage you, to trust in that truth, to trust knowing that Jesus did suffer and die for us on the cross. You see, this Easter is all about what He did for you and for me. Those scars are evidence. Those healed wounds are evidence. A quick story before I end when it comes to scars. I, too, can relate to it. When I was riding on a horse one time at summer camp, I ran into a tree. It took three surgeries for me to get my hand fixed. I bear scars on my wrist. I can't fully use this hand. But these scars remind me of the experience that I went through, the pain that I went through. And when I look at the scars on my own hands, I'm reminded of what Jesus went through. These scars have healed. Sure, I have limitations, but I know that when Jesus Christ comes again, I will be fully healed, and I look forward to that. I won't allow my experience with the horse to hold me back from riding one ever again. Since then, I have ridden the horse that had injured me. But you know what? 
if it wasn't for these scars, I would not fully understand what Christ may have um, went through. I will never understand fully what He went through, but I can somewhat have an idea. These scars of mine remind me of His love. They remind me of the healing power that He gives. And so when it comes to Easter weekend, and when it comes to remembering what Christ did, yes, He sacrificed His body, His whole body, His hands, His feet, His forehead for you and for me. Because that is what Easter is all about, remembering that Christ died on the cross for you and me because He loved us so much. God bless and take care. Good morning, friends. It's great to greet you again in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and Pastor George Rowe from the Chetwin Gospel Tabernacle right here in Chetwin. Today, I'm going to talk about love, love, and more love. Yeah, this presentation was put together during uh, Valentine's week, and so that's why I want to talk about love today. I want to quote Jesus in John 13 and 34, and he said, A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. Wow! Love one another as I have loved you. Jonathan Swift, the author of Gulliver's Travel that goes back to uh, 1726, just a few years before I was born, he made this quote, We have just enough of religion to make us hate, but not enough to make us love one another. And yet Jesus exhorts us to love one another as He loved us. And so, during Valentine week, we are exposed to a somewhat superficial, surface kind of love that sometimes is only as deep as a pie crust. But we make every attempt to express our love to our spouses, our children, our extended families, and our friends. And in expressing that love, we kind of, sometimes we'll buy a sentimental card. Sometimes there's a floral arrangement, or we even dare buy jewelry. We take our spouse out to a lovely dinner, give them a kiss on the cheek, play a favorite song, and we do these things to express our love to tell them, I love you. There is absolutely nothing wrong with any attempt we make to show, to display, to express our love. The intentions are commendable. But today, I want to talk about a love that is not self-produced, or invented in a lab, or found in a cosmetic bottle, or simply discovered by the reading of a book, or sitting through a romantic movie. I want to talk about a love that is produced in heaven and comes from the very heart of God. It is a love without dimensions. In Greek, there are a number of words that's used to describe love. 
For instance, there is eros. It talks about an erotic, passionate love between partners. There is philia, or some call it filio. It's the love of friends and our equals. There's a storge love, which is usually the love that parents would pay toward their children. And there is agape. That's the love I want to talk about today. Agape is an unconditional love. That's the kind of love that God has for you and me. And you know, ladies and gentlemen, the unconditional love of God is definitely not something invented in a lab. It is not found in a textbook. It is not produced by the efforts of humankind. Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. Just follow me here for a moment. This concept of love is not new. The Old Testament says, love your neighbor as yourself. In Deuteronomy 6 and 5, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your heart. Well, in John 13 and 34, Jesus is setting a new standard of love. He says, love as I have loved you. And it's a love without pretension. It is a love without conditions. It is to love without expecting anything in return. To love, though we may feel that we ourselves are unloved. Agape is to love, though you may have sometimes been misunderstood. You see, we aren't really loving people until we love as Jesus loved us. And you might say, well, Pastor George, I cannot love like that. I'm not capable of loving like that. It is not within me to love people as Jesus loved me. You know what? You are right. You're right on. Within ourselves, we cannot love people as Jesus loved them. But remember that God is love. And get this, God lives in you. And because God lives in you, then you are filled with the love of God. And as Christians who are God-filled and Jesus-filled and Holy Spirit-filled, then that love within us, the love of God that is within us, we can pour it out of our lives into the lives of other people. Amen? Paul says in Romans, God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom He has given us. Isn't that awesome? And so when God pours it in, we reciprocate that love by reaching out and loving other people as Jesus loved us. Corinth was a church that Paul had established in about, oh, 50, 55 AD, and he was proud of his church. It was a cosmopolitan community. It was diverse in so many ways, but it became a splintered church. And Paul needed to address it because the Bible says, after all, above all, love each other dearly because love covers over a multitude of sin. So how is Paul going to address the divisions and the strife and the difficulties and the challenges within the Corinthian church, just as we as pastors today would address problematic situations in our church. Paul talks about love. 
Now remember, 1 John says, God is love. And so here's what Paul says about love. Love is patient and kind. Love is never jealous or envious, never boastful or proud. This is agape love. Love never haughty or selfish or rude. Love does not demand its own way. It is not irritable or touchy. It does not hold grudges and will hardly ever notice when others do it wrong. It is never glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. If you love someone, you will be loyal to him no matter what the cost. You will always believe in him, always expect the best of him, and always stand your ground in defending them. Can we do that in our own strength? Absolutely not. In fact, we can't even train ourselves to love in that kind of a way. But remember, as I said earlier, because God lives in your heart, and because God is love, God is love, we can help other people around us by simply expressing the love of God. And Paul finishes by saying to the splintered, divisive church in Corinth, there are three things that still remain. There's faith, there is hope, and there is love. But the greatest of these is love. Let me give you some good advice here. I would suppose that 99% of what I've said already this morning, you agree with. You agree with this kind of love that must be amplified or amplified by Christians. We know that. Intellectually, we know it. Within our heart, we believe it. But are we always doing it? Are we exercising that love for those around us? So some good advice today. Don't just listen to God's Word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. In other words, yeah, pastor, I believe it. I know it. I accept it in my heart. And day after day after day, I want to amplify the agape love of God. And you know the best way to start? Right in your own home, with your spouse, with your children, within your church, within your community, with your fellow workers. Just reach out in love and God will bless you. Have yourself an awesome day. Just allow me a moment to pray with you. And so, God, you are a God of love. And I pray right now for those who are watching and that those who are listening, that your love will not only be in them, but around them and will govern them every single day. If there are those today who are hurting for lack of love, let your love fill them. In the name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen. Have an awesome day. God's blessing upon you. Amen.
Hi, I'm Jillian McDonald, a local Tim Hortons owner for Chetwind. And it's camp day and all of our proceeds from hot and iced coffee go to the Tim's Foundation Camps. Um, at the restaurants locally, we're doing a bunch of different incentives. Um, pick a sucker for a chance to win a prize. We are doing toss a toonie for prizing as well as selling camp day bracelets and camp day socks. So in the 30 year history of Camp Day, we have nationally raised $225 million and helped send over 300,000 kids to camp between the ages of 12 and 16. Come on down to your local Tim Hortons or if you're in Chetwin, come see us. Uh, we have police officers washing windows in the drive through lane, which is always a fun time. Please come and help us send a kid to camp. This is how our community celebrated National Indigenous Peoples Day at Spirit Park in Chetwin, BC. Enjoy. Enjoy.